Well, it looks like um, we've got a good group here. And so I think um, we should get going and um, allow others to join us um, along the way. Um, I know that everyone's busy today and I just wanna thank you for taking some time um, with us at PCG. We have scheduled um, to talk about three sales strategies to unlock your tomorrow. And so this, com this conversation is really going to be around best practices and three strategies that hopefully will help you in your organizations to um, better uh, equip yourselves with some sales um, initiatives. So uh, first off, I'd like to introduce myself and um, Dada, who will be talking with you today. Um, Donna, oh, how um, are you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Donna is the head of PCG. She um, leads our global sales team um, with knowledgeable and seasoned sales executives, and we deliver content and services to libraries um, on behalf of our partners and publishers in the scholarly market. 15 years ago, Donna started um, with us at PCG, um, is, was dedicated to the North American sales position for one publisher, but along the way, she's expanded her knowledge um, of the international markets um, by managing a dedicated global team um, with key partners. Last few years, Donna has been involved in the full spectrum of PCG's business offerings. Um, and throughout her tenure, she's um, helped PC grow with dynamic and um, as a dynamic and nimble company. Um, so I appreciate um, Donna um, helping me today with this. I am Heather Lance, and I uh, am the manager of a direct um, sales team with, in the North American regions. Um, and basically, we basically focus on um, best of knowledge and marketing initiatives um, for our publishers. And um, we have um, a wide spectrum of publishers that we represent, but our team is um, very um, experienced in how we uh, approach our team's um, initiatives and how we look to grow organically. So that's really what this presentation is going to be about today. A little bit about uh, PCG and Ingenta, if you aren't aware of um, who we are. We were founded in 1999, um, a division of Ingenta, who really is a content solutions provider, um, cover to cover, process to process, uh, all the content systems and audience development um, softwares and services for publishers, um, as well as we're um, branching out to other media um, solution providers. PCG, uh, we're known internationally, recognized for obviously sales and marketing consulting. And we do um, provide a wide range of services to help publishers with their strategies from lead generation to closing sales. Uh, the topics uh, that we are going to discuss today in this presentation are really about organic growth, thought leadership, and networking. Uh, so wanted to kind of dive into this a little bit. The uh, first step is organic growth. And so we all know that it's easy to upsell and it's a lot harder to um, gain new sales, new partnerships. And so what I wanted to focus on uh, are some tips and tricks that my team, being that they're um, of tenure and have been in this industry a long time, most of them over 15 years, we kind of have our toolkit. And I think that is a really important piece to start with um, for organic growth is, you know, not just smiling and dialing and cold calling like most um, sales teams do or how we, um, you know, provide uh, services to our partners, but through some tools that we have. So covering some of that, obviously you have to have a good CRM and keep in keeping it updated, um, garbage in, garbage out. Obviously you probably all heard that a thousand times, but, you know, keeping good notes and keeping it up to date is key um, to chasing after organic growth. The other thing that I would advise is um, if you're going to send email, have some kind of a tool in place where you can track who's engaging with your email. Just like um, you know, some of the marketing initiatives and campaigns you're aware of, there are tools like Yesware out there that will help you to engage with your email on the back end. Another way to track some organic growth, obviously, is LinkedIn groups. I'm sure most of you are aware of um, you know, the groups that are in your subject areas and disciplines, but I can't stress enough knowing what's important to your top prospects is key to having a good conversation with them outside of a sales arena. So being a consultant to them, and we'll get into that in a little bit. LinkedIn, um, the advanced search feature, it's probably changed about three or four times in its offerings um, and in what package it's uh, um, available in. But 
this is a, a big piece to um, doing some prospecting and for organic growth within a department or within an organization. Um, using this will help you to uncover some key contacts that maybe you weren't aware of. And then it's great to have names and in industry information, but you also have to be able to reach out to them. So we utilize something called Email Hunter. Um, it is a paid subscription um, offering, but it does give you some great new contact information that you can't find just crawling the web, which will help you with your organic growth. And then um, looking up directories and associations that pertain to the product. So directories being things like SLA, ALA um, in this industry, or associations, um, there is a ton of them out there that will help you to network, um, to grow, to learn, and to share information back and forth. The next thing that I stress with my team is time management. For organic growth, it is really important to focus on the um, things that are essential, things that will get you to your goals. We all have a lot of tasks that we have to do and prioritizing your day um, and your week is really important. So making sure that you divide your time, um, and I have some quotes up here, um, it's, it's essential for those who are successful year over year and those that aren't. Um, so knowing what takes up your time, knowing how to prioritize your day actually does get you to um, more successful sales. Um, sorry about that. The next piece um, in this is once you have in individuals in front of you, I think it's really key um, to qualify your organic um, prospects. So these people may not know who you are, but um, getting these questions out of the gate will help you to have a meaningful conversation down the road. If you don't have answers to these questions, you're dealing with a lead. And the definition of a lead for me is somebody that is unqualified and really doesn't know what you're um, offering and really doesn't have an invested interest in your partnership. So um, these key pieces here, I think are crucial to starting a relationship, starting that conversation. Um, budgeting obviously is a big piece of it but also knowing what challenges them, what initiatives, what grants they're writing for, um, who has most of their attention. Uh, um, librarians um, and academic um, advisors all have um, different things that are really near and dear to them and, and understanding what those are will help along the way to um, you know, retaining and getting new sales. Um. So the next piece is how do you fuel it? Um, everyone wants to spam, right? Everyone wants to um, get their message out. And if I probably would say the most conversations I have with my teams along the years is that um, mass mailing is really not a great strategy. Um, it's not building a relationship. It's really just turning people off. Um, we all get a lot of email, but I would say that if you're going to send an email, um, to soften the beach in your conversation. Introduction emails are important, but your sales line is key. Um, so subject line, if it isn't something that is of interest, it doesn't catch your attention, it's gonna um, fall under the priority of other things and, and probably not be opened. So avoiding a sales pitch is important. And always, I always ask the, the reps what their hook is. So purpose of an email, what's your solution? What's the need? And then promote that. Um, before you even talk about product. Um, and then also, and I continue to say this, learn about your prospects and share information with them, that's important. And then finally, cultivating your growth. Um, you know, that CRM, going back to that, scheduling tasks for yourself, staying organized, using yes, where to follow your opens and connecting um, with them as appropriate. I don't necessarily tell you to jump on the email the second you see someone open an email, but understanding how they're opening that email, what time of day, um, how many times they forward it. These are the kinds of pieces of information that you're given. And you can utilize that to um, schedule your next call with them and have it be meaningful to them. Also watching Google Analytics for your prospects in the news or their websites and then reaching out to them in a timely fashion when something is applicable. Um, another rule of thumb, I think, is eight tries and move on. How many times do you try to connect with somebody and you're just getting nowhere? 
I would say it's about eight times and eight times is about the um, number of making an impression as well. And then use the tools, social media and Google alerts um, and ask for referrals. So you all have hopefully a book of business um, that have had really good relationships with you and have had a good success using your products um, or services. So using that to open doors um, and network is crucial and I think helps you know us to get to the next level and it is really true that people buy from people they like. So, you know, making that human element and remembering things about your prospects and your network um, only makes you, you know, more of a human and, and more of a personal um, individual versus just another sales rep and another call. And the next section, um, I want to talk a little bit more about thought leadership and what that means um, in a sales environment. Um, Making marketing personas is, I think, a key piece to starting in this industry because the only way that you're going to be a thought leader is to really know who you're communicating with and what's important to them. So here's some questions that are um, typical of starting to draw that map and um, what the job title is, what their priorities are. Typically, you know, we even give them a name and, and their age and um, that kind of thing. Cause then when you start to talk to with individuals, you put them in buckets in your mind and you, you start to, um, understand or have a better understanding of maybe what they're facing in a day. So it helps to create a story. Um, and as you continue to talk with individuals, that story will grow. So keeping this up to date and knowing who you're interacting with is key, um, in thought leadership. Being a product expert is also key, um, in thought leadership. If you don't know, the ins and out of what your offer is, um, it really makes it tough for someone to accept you as a consultant or a thought leader. So it's really important to know um, who uses your product, what market and industry it's best suited for, uh, what title path it's best suited for, how to solve um, problems with your, with your solution. Maybe there's multiple problems that it, it does address. Um, knowing what the true features and benefits are to the customer, not ones that you know, maybe your product management team has given you, um, what makes your product unique to solving those problems. So comparing it to the competitors um, and knowing what your hook is and then knowing your competitors inside and out is also key because when these questions come up, um, they're gonna expect you to be the thought leader and to help them understand um, what your solution really has got to offer. Also consultive marketing, um, everyone, probably has a couple favorite commercials, right? Things or imagery in your mind or a good story um, from a company that either you've purchased from or it just, they have a great marketing team and, and they're telling you that they're going above and beyond just what they do. So Apple, obviously, think different. Um, we probably all remember the earbuds and that whole initiative. They really do um, go to their why and then it becomes what the product actually does afterwards. De Beers, diamonds are forever. They tell a story. Um, and, and so I really encourage everyone um, is, as much as a thought leader is, is to tell a compelling story, maybe of a time that you've helped somebody, maybe of a time that your product um, in conception um, was brought to be because of someone somewhere had an issue and you were able to solve it. So. I, I think that as a thought leader, making it um, as personable and as visionary is as important as making it something that people will remember. The another piece, um, obviously, in um, our social media rings, content marketing is important, but I think the wave of where everyone um, is leaning is really to video. And um, the reason I say that is because if you look at TikTok, its projection of growth is so high. And I'm already seeing um, in, in the marketing things that I follow, people advising about how to use TikTok in your marketing. And so um, Instagram is probably a close second as new to our um, industry. But I think if you can create dynamic things that are helpful to librarians and just to end users, the more your product is branded, the more it's going to become recognized. Um, blogs, not just your own. For a while there, it was turn and burn. Get as much content out there 
um, get your name recognition out there. Now I think it's thought leadership and content marketing is more around how we can help our industry. Um, we care about this industry. Um, what can we add to the conversation? So adding to blogs that are maybe not just your own. Also give presentations and be a panelist on, at your conferences that you attend. I think that's key too, to getting not just your brand out there, but that your company has something to add to the industry. And then corporate website links. Um, you know, I think it's important to be connected. To, if you want further information, it's still important to have a good website with up-to-date content um, that has further deeper dives of information if someone is looking for it. Um, no one wants to listen to a sales pitch. And I think you all know that most times when you do get a, a warm lead in, they've been searching your web, they've been looking for content um, and they already have a good idea where they come to you most of the time. So having these things available will only help you to be a thought leader. A little bit more about um, video. Um, it is, this is an high Q um, quote, you know, looking at how much video is being watched, I, I think is kind of just a known factor these days. But um, I also wanted to give you guys some good video makers because I know some of you may not have robust um, marketing teams. Some of you may be doing some things on your own. So Biddable is a really great service um, with great icons. I've also recommend BrainShark because it works like a PowerPoint. Um, and so saving time and conserving energy a little bit. Um, these are some video makers that um, will help you to just um, jump into that foray if you haven't yet. And then um, the next piece that we're gonna talk about is networking um, with consortia. And at this time, I'm gonna turn over the mic to Donna. Hello, how are you all today? Um, so um, I'm going to start um, with a little information on um, what consortia are and so forth. Um, I remember uh, when I uh, went on to a new client, um, this was many, many years ago, uh, my um, boss said, the first thing you need to do with this um, uh, client is understand what consortia versus consortium means. Um, one singular, one's plural. And it's kind of a funny story, but you do really um, need to have a lot of understanding around how co consortia operate and function in order to work with them um, as easily as possible. Um, basically, there are so many different kinds of consortia, and that's what makes it a little bit um, mind boggling sometimes and why uh, a little bit of knowledge will help you to work within that community. Um, they can be anywhere from a buying group uh, to uh, former, uh, former roles of uh, the network, OCLCA networks, where they did a lot of training and there's interlibrary loans, uh, services, document delivery, things like that. So it really does run the gambit of what a consortium may or may not provide. There's also a size to be uh, considered. There are some very, very large large consortia, and then there are consortia that just have a few people. Um, and they could be uh, very broadly focused or very um, subject specific focused. So it does run um, a wide spectrum. The funding is also an area that uh, can add uh, lead to a lot of confusion. There are many that the funding comes from individual membership fees. But there are also consortia where there's central funding. Many times that's um, linked to governmental budgets. Uh, this, there is um, centrally funded consortia within North America. I would say it is much more prevalent outside of North America. Um, but it does exist definitely in North America as well. Um, and then within those uh, centrally funded consortias, they may or may not have a central pool of money for purchasing content. 
um, or the uh, opt-in by individual institutions where the individual institution, um, the budget from an individual institution is what pays for the subscription. The um, consortia, again, because of based on size, can be either have a central staff or it could be shared among the various uh, librarians that are involved in that consortia. The, oh, <laughs> uh, the ones that are more consortia uh, staff focused um, can sometimes, it depends, but sometimes can be better focused for um, the, for, for marketing your products. Uh, they have more services to get that information out to the individual institutions rather than the volunteer uh, organizations. So I would start by thinking about where you want to grow your business and using uh, the one or two consortia to kind of um, learn how to do this, to, to approach this. The, um, so which, which institutions, which consortia do you think about uh, starting with then? And it, there's a lot of factors to consider, but your weakest subscription base re by region um, or by type of institution might be the best way to start. Um, the, <clears throat> I'm sorry. The um, region, the consortia can cover various regions. They can cover uh, subject areas. So it really makes a, a, a determination as to which region to cover, or we, which sec segment to cover. Uh, the other thing that's really imp important is analyzing where, how you want to price the product to the consortia. And that takes a lot of um, analysis and thinking about. Some of the things to think about is what's your break-even threshold? For example, uh, you may have uh, subscribers that are already part of that consortia. You're going to end up having to discount to those current subscribers that you have. So what is the uh, threshold that you're going to come out to a break-even point in terms of revenue. Uh, what kind? Uh, the other th the other things that I think are important to consider is or are um, the the costs involved in selling to that consortia. So, for example, do they um, um, do they have um, administrative costs, what are the administrative costs for selling to that consortia? That's a key thing that I think a lot of people forget, and that is asking these questions. Who's going to be doing the, the invoicing? Uh, are you going to be able to invoice them uh, with a single invoice, or are you going to have to individually invoice the institutions directly? That there are some consortia that do it uh, one way and some consortia that do it another way. That in, that factors into what price you want to uh, end up selling to them um, because there's different costs in involved in that. Uh, this happens more outside of North America, but uh, letters of credit, many of the different um, uh, countries with, uh, with especially with uh, government funded institutions, you might have to um, have letters of credits. Uh, paperwork, the, the COPAS consortium in, in Brazil is legendary for the amount of paperwork um, that needs to happen uh, from getting um, notarized documents, um, uh, apostille documents, and the like. That all comes at a cost, so it's important to not forget about those costs. 
Uh, what's the payment terms? Think about that. What are your payment terms? Um, because that could be a cost if they it might take if it takes you six months to get paid after the invoice, um, then you might want to consider that in, in terms of how you will price them. Um, sorry. Uh, oh, the tiering options. That's another um, factor. A lot of people like to price uh, based on the number of institutions involved. And that uh, can, it's very, very popular, but I do think it offers some confusion um, because it can um, wait, have a wait and see approach to it where the institutions will say, well, yeah, so if they end up getting um, the five, more institutions and that will give us a discount then we'll do it but we won't do it otherwise uh, but it is in fact a very popular uh pricing model my uh thought on on it is if you are you, you definitely want to have a minimum number of um participants that is a key whether it's five or 10 or whatever, that's uh, to me very important uh, to ensure that it's worth the effort to go to this, um, through this, this deal. Uh, because the level of marketing that they do versus your time, it can also uh, factor into how you want to uh, price it and how um, robust the deal will be. So some of the uh, consortia in um, North America, um, you can focus on heavily researched institutions uh, through like the Gwila, Neural, CRL, the, they're very large. Um, they tend to members have membership in very large uh, organizations, research uh, institutions, uh, or you can focus on um, smaller colleges, um, Skelk um, has a large number of California uh, smaller colleges, the Oberlin Group, um, ACA, Appalachia College, they all have smaller, um, uh, have a focus on smaller institutions. There's also the um, regional type state institutions, the Palsies, um, Wills, there's um, BCI in, in Quebec, uh, Viva is another one that is um, state um, focused or within a university library system. CDL is pro well, well known, um, but Texas A&M, um, there's also University of Minneapolis, but there's also uni the University of Wisconsin. So there's, there's, there's many of them um, that band together for buying purposes. Um, regional uh, major consortia players. Okay. Uh, Lyricist definitely started out <laughs> uh, more regionally, but they're quite large now. So they might be um, uh, go a little beyond um, what would just be considered regional. They're a, a, a merger from a, a number of former OCLC networks. Um, Minitex, again, covers um, a certain regional area. Uh, Amigo started out in Texas. Um, they have expanded definitely beyond Texas. Um, but um, again, it's, it's, there's a large focus in, in Texas. There's hybrid um, consortia that um, also host their own platforms. Um, sort of, Ohio, certainly Ohio Link was probably the gold standard um, years of years ago. Uh, I'm sure they 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 still exist and so forth, but it's not at the host locally hosted platforms. Um, there are not as many of them as there used to be. Um, Oak uh, Oakal did start one, um, their scholars portal about, I can't remember now, maybe eight years ago or something like that. So they, they, are, they are still out there, but uh, um, with the discovery platforms and things like that, I don't think they're as, um, as, as robust as they used to be, or probably not as many as there, as there used to be. Um, I will say that um, when you're looking at consortia, 
I do think you want to, um, a resource that would be very good to look at is the International Coalition of Library Consortia. Um, that is a group of, a, it's a consortia of, cons, of consortia, uh, or, or, excuse me, a consortium of consortia. And um, what that will give you is links to websites uh, of the various consortia. So that's a great place to start your research. Um, once you get really involved in co consortia, you may want to invest in the Ringo product. Um, that could be a, uh, a good source of information for you um, if you really um, want to invest in that market. Uh, and especially, it's probably outside of North America, it's very good. But um, the, um, the um, ICO, LC is a, um, a good beginning source. And let's see, did I forget anything else? Oh, when we were talking about pricing models, um, there can be um, other options where you can get involved in multi years. And um, some people have um, some reservations about multi years, uh, but they, they will again save administrative costs because they um, set the price for uh, several years. And many of them do want an out opt-out clause still uh, uh, with a multi-year deal. And we've gotten creative with some of them and you know set it uh, that the opt-out can only come into play, say with a set percentage of the budget of an institution's budget is cut and then is that the opt-out could come into play then. So there's a number of ways you can get creative um, in terms of setting up the pricing. One of the, uh, in, in closing, I would say the big thing is to really think through and ask a number of questions of the consortia in terms of how they promote the product, how much of promotion, promoting they will do versus how many, how much promoting you have to do. Um, and any um, librarians within a consortia at individual institutions uh, that will help to, you champion the product um, while it's in trial within a consortia will be very beneficial in having a successful um, deal come out of a consortia trial. In summary, um, use the, the various tr sales tools that uh, Heather was talking about, I think um, is something that we talk to our sales rep um, on and on about and, and with regularity. Um, I would say the CRM and recording the information is really a very strong key to um, moving forward. Uh, as she said, time management and organizing your day. Um, and get, not getting caught up in um, the busy work. And I think the email, when she was mentioning email campaigns and so forth, I think we can all get caught up a little bit in that in terms of the busy work. Um, and we think we're being productive, uh, but we're really not um, being as productive as we should be. Uh, again, she said, knowing your product, knowing your product inside and out is, really crucial to um, being able to answer your, the questions your, your clients will have and um, being able to move the product, product forward uh, through the sales uh, cycle. Just wanted to add, you know, what you're saying about um, product ad addressing your market. It's really more than just the benefits and features. Just remember that you created the product for a reason and addressing that why and telling that story um, really does garner more interest and um, almost a acceptance to 
you as a lead, thought leader than just um, being really knowledgeable in, in your field. Um, and it opens a lot of doors for your company to partner with other others and um, you know your thought leaders in the libraries as well. And I think it also enhances maybe your offerings in the future. Um, the final thing, in, which is what Donna was going over, I feel like the biggest networks available in this industry are consortia. Um, they band together for a reason to expand their resources. Um, some of them may not have gotten the resources they have if there wasn't a consortia for them. And they're very open to um, new ideas and understanding um, what you're offering and how they can help you even. So don't neglect, um, even if they're just a buying club and not an overarching all in, um, I, in which those are really the prevalent in the United States now is more of a buy-in club. I think that is a great resource for um, starting out and networking and, and learning your industry the best. I just want to thank you for um, your attendance today. Connect with us if you want to. We'll be doing more of these sessions um, about different things that Ingenta and PCG offer and hoping to um, become a little bit more of a thought leader um, and, and sharing our information. Here is our email address, um, Donna and myself. So feel free to reach out to us um, and give us any comments or feedback or questions that you have. We greatly appreciate your time um, today and thank you and look forward to talking with you again soon. Have a great day.